welcome. Welcome everybody to our Big Bang Gala, our annual gala, and to African Tusher Hall, Tusher African Hall. <laughs> um, I'm Shannon Bennett. I'm Chief of Science here. Harry and Diana Hind, Dean of Science and Research Collections, Patterson Scholar, and Associate Curator of Microbiology for the Institute for Biodiversity Science and Sustainability here at the Academy. <laughs> I didn't have to look at my notes. <laughs> so one of the perks of such a lofty set of titles is occasionally I get to go on field site visits, just occasionally, and recently, uh, a team of academy scientists and science communicators and citizen science outreach specialists went to the academy, and ex exhibition ex specialists, we, we went to the Galapagos and we saw firsthand what a truly spectacular archipelago the Galapagos is. And we're gonna talk more about that tonight through insightful conversations with these two gentlemen who I'll introduce in a minute. But we really want to share with you uh, the Galapagos. The Academy has a deep, long history with the Galapagos. You may have had a chance to browse some of the artifacts that represent some of the historical um, experiences of our, of our crew on the Academy schooner to, to the Galapagos Islands in the 19, early 1900s. You, um, you will hear tonight about uh, how very special the Galapagos is. The Galapagos, uh, for over two centuries now, uh, began uh, with inspiring Darwin and his theory of evolution with the spectacular um, geological formations, the volcanoes, the uh, amazing creatures, the marine iguanas, the tropical equator equatorial penguins, uh, and a, a bird called the Galapagos mo Mockingbird that really um, inspired Darwin to develop his theory of biological evolution. Uh, importantly, you're going to hear a little bit about some of the challenges, the conservation challenges that the Galapagos faces, and how we can work together with partners to uh, use science and evidence-based uh, uh, discoveries to best inform how we can conserve the Galapagos for a, a sustainable future for all. So I'm very excited. Um, before I introduce our two uh, conversationalists, I would like to um, give you a heads up. This will be about a 35-minute conversation. I hope to invite you to ask questions at the end. And we're going to start with a brief video that will capture, I think, some of the excitement that we all have had being to the Galapagos. It will transport you there, and you'll feel firsthand what it was like to be there. So with that, I invite Abby to cue up the video. In the vastness of the Pacific, there's a paradise unlike any other. Enchanted volcanic islands where life has played out in isolation from the rest of the world and produced some extraordinary results. The fauna and flora of these islands are perfect stars. that have taken to the ocean and spit salt from their noses. Giant tortoises that roam freely in their thousands. And an abundance of extraordinary plants. Bizarre insects. And unique animals. Some of which have never been filmed before. Truly a wonderland of magic and discovery.
So you see what I mean, how amazing it was. I forgot to mention the iconic Galapagos tortoises, which of course are completely mind-blowing. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce our two guests tonight for our inspiring conversation, Dr. Arturo Izurieta, who is the director of the Charles Darwin Foundation. He is in charge of strategic planning, uh, scientific research, uh, developing and growing partnerships with government authorities, indigenous groups, scientific communities. He collaborates with researchers and institutions in Ecuador, as well as all over the world, including the California Academy of Sciences, to support long-term conservation and sustainability initiatives in the Galapagos Islands. So welcome, Dr. Zirita. And then I'd like to introduce Dr. Matthew James. He is a fellow of the California Academy of Sciences, a professor of geology and paleontology at Sonoma State University, a governing member of the Charles Darwin Foundation in the Galapagos Islands. And Matthew has been writing about history, science, and research in the Galapagos for more than 30 years and is the author of Collecting Evolution, the authoritative book on the Academy's historic 1905 expedition to the Galapagos. So thank you, Dr. James. So with that, I'd like to get us started. I would uh, love to hear from both of you about what your aha moment was that inspired you to begin your, your lifelong work in the Galapagos. Who wants to go first? <laughs> go for it. <laughs> um, since I was a kid, uh, these islands called up my attention. I was born in Quito, uh, the capital of Ecuador. Um, and when I was 10 years old, um, I wanted to go to the islands, to this place, this magic place, where animals do not run away from man, where man feels part of nature, where there's no creatures that will get away from you. And that was a feeling that I wanted to feel. Uh, I always wanted to be a medical doctor. Uh, didn't turn out to be. But uh, anyhow, um, when I was 20, I arrived in the Galapagos Islands. Uh, I had studied uh, biology uh, as a student, and then I stayed. So it was the magic of these islands, the uniqueness, the fragility, and the sense for man to be linked uh, with nature. That, that's what caught up my attention, and I stayed. Yes. And it's true, we did have to walk around the marine iguanas that were blocking the pathway or the sidewalk. But the fishes swam away. So that, that pattern does not count for fishes. <laughs> I, I, I was really expecting all the animals. To... <laughs> um, I figured that um, uh, the, the marine life is something that still needs to be discovered. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that the terrestrial part of it uh, uh, holds mysteries, as we have heard in, in this uh, short video. But uh, indeed, um, there are certain areas where you go and dive and you are surrounded by fish. Uh, however, yes, there is more predators, I suppose, down mm -hmm. under the water. And, and mm -hmm. even though uh, man uh, is one of those predators, uh, snorkeling and or diving, um, you have the sea lions coming and playing around with you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and sharks too. They're, I mean, uh, it's it's amazing. Uh, it seems like you know, humans have not been a, a creature for sharks that uh, they have been accustomed to, to yeah. go for. So I think there's certain tameness, but yes, indeed, indeed. The, the fish would go away. Yeah, it's okay. Matt? Well, I was thinking that when I was growing up, I, I grew up in Hawaii and I went to school there from kindergarten through college that my mother used to always say, Matthew, stop exaggerating so much. And um, I, I, I would say that, well, maybe there was a time or two, maybe, um, when that might have happened. But I do want to assure you all that when I write about the history of the academy, I never, ever, ever exaggerate. There so, he goes again. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and so for me, th this opportunity presented itself to write about the history of the Academy and its expedition to the Galapagos, and that unfolded slowly over time, where at first I was writing just about the leader of the expedition, and I was writing about the, the schooner, the sailboat that went on the expedition, and then it became clear that it would need to be uh, the complete story of the entire expedition, um, dovetailing with the history of the Academy. And so that opportunity uh, came up at a time when I was looking for a project that could be just mine, I wanted something that, that I didn't have to uh, necessarily count on other people to either get work done or, or, or anything like that. And so um, it was also a topic that was not covered before. There really was no treatment of this expedition in 1905 and 1906 that, that had been published you know, in any popular form, literally in any popular form. And so the, the stories that go along with it are, are just numerous, such as the schooner that they took with them was almost used as target practice up in Seattle by the Navy um, and would have been sunk. Um, that vessel ends up in San Francisco and goes aground on Yerba Buena Island. And the Academy could not get a schooner until they were able to then purchase this schooner. They had to delay their, their uh, Galapagos expedition by over a year. Had they gone when they wanted to go, they would have finished the expedition of 17 months and come back to San Francisco in March of 1906 and put everything away into the Academy uh, on Market Street, not even the building here or the predecessor building here. And uh, it would have obviously all been destroyed. So inadvertently, sort of ironically, they weren't able to go when they wanted to go. And when you're writing about history, you're often tempted to tap people on the shoulder and say sort of like, you, you might want to take a jacket with you today, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, you're not able to. And then even at the very end of that expedition, when they're just about ready to get back to San Francisco, and this would be when they're at the mouth of the Golden Gate. But of course, this is the bridgeless Golden Gate, because the Golden Gate Bridge is not built until the 1930s. They almost went aground and lost everything from this 17-month expedition, literally on Thanksgiving night of 1906. So the, the chances that this would have happened, that it would have been successful, were so greatly variable over time mm -hmm. that it, it, it's a marvel that it really did happen, and it was a pleasure for me to tell that story. Well, thank you. It's, a, it's an amazing story of serendipity, and um, I, I was actually going to ask you to, to reflect a little. For the people that don't know in the room, the expedition was collecting in the Galapagos. It left in 1905 and returned in 1906, and in between times we had the San Francisco fire in which the academies, the bulk of the academy's collections were lost to the fire. Uh, following that quake. So maybe you could reflect a little bit on that, on that expedition and how its serendipitous success has really transformed the Academy's history. Well, I, I think in, in many ways you could say that the Galapagos are a birthplace. Uh, they're the birthplace of volcanic islands that rise from the seafloor. Uh, they're the birthplace of new species that arise from ancestral species. They're also the birthplace of ideas that come from expeditions and scientific study. And they're also the birthplace of everything living there today. And you could say, um, you know, uh, warnings about my, my proclivities to exaggerate, uh, it's also the rebirthplace of the academy. So one could argue, and I have, that maybe the academy would have had a very difficult time getting back on its feet after the 1906 earthquake, if not for the, the large amount of material that they collected. And notably, they caused nothing to go extinct. Um, and and uh, it, that also helped to, to rebuild the academy um, in the meantime. So. Amazing. Um, it's, I think nobody is doubting how special the Galapagos is. Um, and yet, I think today it's facing uh, a lot of challenges that might threaten that unique biodiversity. I wonder, Arturo, if you could reflect on some of the, the challenges that you see uh, facing the island today, how it might be affecting the unique biodiversity, the flora and fauna that you've come to love. Yes, indeed. Um, you have seen this wonderful short film, and uh, the Galapagos Islands are still pristine. Uh, they are one of the most uh, island ecosystems well preserved in the world still. Uh, I know that you, you came from Hawaii and studying in Hawaii. 95% uh, of the biota of Hawaii has been lost. It's 5% that remains there. It's the contrary in the Galapagos Islands. Um, and yet, um, 
we don't see human beings in that film, but there is a population of 30,000 people living in four different islands. And uh, there are challenges, uh, not only because there is human beings, we are living there, and how we need to um, act according to the fragility and the limitations that, that <coughs> means to be there, um, but also to uh, face globalization because that is affecting the whole planet. Um, so having this, these islands um, the best way possible, um, it, it could really bring us more knowledge in how we as humans uh, can learn from nature how the processes that are happening in, in natural areas, but also processes that, that are, we as humans are influencing to, to, to change. Uh, can, can, we can have these lessons learned and, and share with the world. Um, so I find Galapagos as a microcosms. And it, it, you refer Galapagos as a natural laboratory, but it's, it's a social, it's an economic, it's a institutional laboratory. I arrived there in 1984. And uh, it's been 30, almost 35 years. And uh, still, you find these pristine places, however, Yes, challenges of introduced species because population is growing. You have more influx of, of ships, cargo boats that are bringing uh, goods and, and other services uh, to serve the tourism. Uh, when people ask me, uh, uh, you know, Galapagos has been affected by tourism. I'm, I'm not going to go there because I said, yeah, we need to get connected with nature. You know, we need to be out there more often. And if we get to preserve one of these places, you know, we, we do have hope. That's my, my, my deep feeling, that we as humans can do something and can really act um, uh, towards this, the, the benefit of the planet of, that, that is, is our lives as well. So this is, these are the challenges that, uh, or some of the challenges that we're facing. Yeah. And we need all the help as possible. And that's where we are partnering, partnering yeah. with, with California Academy of Sciences. Right. Well, that's, uh, I was going to ask you to maybe even elaborate a little bit more um, on how, how the Charles Darwin Foundation is approaching some of those challenges. And maybe we can talk also about how the partnership can help face those challenges together. Sure. Um, just recently, uh, the Charles Darwin State, uh, Foundation was uh, founded in 1959. We're celebrating 60 years this year. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, and uh, we established the Charles Darwin Research Station in 1964. And since then, we have been uh, promoting, uh, generating knowledge. And we have been uh, pivotal in, in warning the Ecuadorian government uh, and, and follow certain recommendations in order to have the islands uh, the best way possible. Um, but we cannot do this alone. Uh, so the the synergies and the partnership, and particularly uh, the California Academy of Sciences, with whom we share a, a tremendous history. Uh, Matthew has yeah. shared of, of, of some of that. Even the names, uh, Puerto Ayora uh, uh, is, is an academy bay after the Schooner Academy uh, that, that was collecting uh, back then. Um, so I think there is uh, a lot to do. Um, I, I, I am an optimist. Um, mm -hmm. I know that the, the whole planet is, is, is suffering for um, the actions that we are uh, unconsciously or consciously doing. Um, but uh, when we have these special places uh, where we can demonstrate that there are learning processes that we're humans, we can really interact with nature, learn from nature. Science is, is vital to, to understand how, how we work, how we are part of it. So um, these are my, my, my uh, messages and, yeah. and, and share with you. Yeah. So when we were there, we helped to uh, articulate, put together in three dimensions, a pygmy sperm whale that had uh, stranded in the Galapagos. And I was struck by the, um, the, the transformation of your exhibit hall with the enthusiasm that enveloped this, this design process of rebuilding this this pygmy whale from, from principles uh, the, of how whales should work and how we could share that biology, the, the process of sonar with the public, and how
how the public was, there were school groups there, there were tourists there from all over the world. It was a wonderful and diverse audience that just uh, wanted to know so much about these unique species and the science behind it. Um, and it shows me the power of sharing the, the collections like this, these actual, the actual evidence of the diversity in the Galapagos. Um, I wonder, Matt, if you could um, elaborate on some of the ways that we can share collections, how our collections might have been really pivotal sure. uh, today uh, to the Galapagos and to conservation in the Galapagos. Oh, um, I think it might be worth a, a show of hands that maybe people could raise their hand if you've been to the Galapagos Islands. Oh, okay. And, and, then, and then maybe the, the okay, thank you. And then maybe another show of hands <coughs> for anybody who would like to go. Ah, <laughs> see, there you go. <coughs> and so whether you have been or you would like to go, um, there is always something that comes out in the Galapagos that it is not only, um, you know, nature's outdoor laboratory of evolution, but it's also nature's outdoor museum of evolution as we are here today. So the dioramas here in this hall specifically are very famous, uh, but in the Galapagos you can walk up and see things almost as close or closer than we are here to the dioramas. And so one of the, the connections that is the strongest with the academy is to the entire idea of Darwin's finches, something that's in the high school biology textbooks and college biology textbooks. So in 1905 and 1906, the collection that was made was used in the 1930s by David Lack, an Englishman who wrote, literally wrote the book called Darwin's Finches. And he wrote two versions of it. The first version said the beaks were for telling species apart by the birds themselves. And then the second version that we all know today is that the beaks are used for food specialization. And so that work was done by David Lack on the Academy collections in the building that was here on this site. Um, and he dedicated that book to the staff of the California Academy of Sciences. So of all the ideas that have been born in the Galapagos, the idea of Darwin's finches is directly due to the California Academy of Sciences. So there should be, I think, very proud ownership of that idea, even though, yes, it was uh, done, it was put together by David Lack. Yeah. So it's again, but for the collections that were collected, maybe that idea would be out in a different form or out at a different time. So, so that ownership of an idea is something that the Academy and everyone who's associated with the Academy can be very proud of. And it is one of the most revolutionary ideas um, in, in, uh, in the history of evolution. Right. So, so that is an example of how collections uh, continue to this very day to be important. And hence the name of your book, Collecting Evolution. We, right. we literally have the evidence to support evolution here here at the Academy. Yeah, and they're, they were not collecting, or they were not proving or disproving, yeah. supporting or refuting evolution. They were just collecting. They yeah. were bringing the, the Galapagos Observing. back to San Francisco. Yeah. So, so the Academy and the Charles Darwin Foundation have the most comprehensive collections together in the world that uh, recount the, the Galapagos diversity and record that for the, the powerful study of evolution, but also of conservation and other many, many other applications. And I wonder if you have any examples that you might want to bring to light of some of the ways uh, the collections have helped to inform either your collections or our collections, uh, modern day uh, decisions in the Galapagos. Sure, uh, there's one that comes to my mind and um, it is the studies that we are um, making in collaboration with more than uh, 19 institutions throughout the, um, the world with various continents, but um, from the University of Minnesota, they used the, the specimens that came uh, through the California Academy of, of, of Sciences. They used our specimens to confirm the possibility of the, uh, the larvae of the Philornis fly, the vampire fly that is affecting most of the land birds at the moment in Galapagos. They, um, the, the larvae crawls up um, uh, the, 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 the nostrils or the beak of the, of the newly born birds and they open the, the, the holes of the, of the uh, uh, respiratory. So if you're squeamish them. before dinner. I know, go, go, go. The but biologists anyhow, love it. It was through the collections that the specimens collected um, during the, um, the 60s 
show uh, some of the burrs that have these expanded uh, holes that would give us the information that the fly was already in Galapagos, arrived during the 60s. So we started realizing that the effect of the fly in Galapagos, we found this phenomenon um, in, the, in the 1990s. So it took us 30 years, 30 years to detect the impact, but we found out that the fly had been there um, for a longer time, and this was due to the collections. If we would have not had the collections, then we would have just been wondering how long those flies have been there for, and thus affecting the, uh, the bird life that is yeah. that we're trying to, to save. Yeah, incredible. Mm. We, we have a similar story about using our collections to track when pox virus arrived to the Galapagos birds, the Galapagos finches, and uh, where it came from using genetic information. Indeed, uh, collections um, bring history, and, and history is, uh, is, is, is something that is an inherent, um, um, uh, uh, inherent in, in, in science and in, in our way of, of living. Uh, so if we don't have the collections, we don't have history. Yeah. And how can we learn if yeah. we don't have those? Good point. Um, what, one of the, the uh, things that amazes me is the spirit of ongoing discovery. Uh, the discoveries we've made into the collections, it's like we can take an expedition into the collections and still find new things we never could anticipate. Um, but we've also talked about the Galapagos as a living laboratory, and that suggests this sort of dynamic and ongoing sense of discovery. New species are coming in, the climate is changing, the water is changing, I wonder if um, you could talk about some new discoveries. Maybe you could ref refer to the most recent new discovery in Fernandina that's gotten people <laughs> so excited. Um, collections uh, from, uh, and I was talking to uh, Dr. Wallabeck, uh, who is a scientist oh, yes. from, um, Dr. from the California Academy of Sciences uh, back in the, uh, uh, he was part of the uh, expedition, 1905, 1906. Uh, he's he's uh, standing back there. <laughs> um, uh, but also, uh, Charles Allen was, oh, he's back there too. <laughs> we're talking about the, the, the different ways in which collections and methods were at that time. And collections are different nowadays. Um, however, uh, yes, there are, there are new techniques that uh, are related to collections, um, uh, techniques that uh, we could use to identify possible um, uh, minerals or, or um, uh, um, tracking down um, poison or in the tissues or in the, in the bones in the past and, and the ones that are right. collected nowadays. So this is, these are some of the, 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 the new things that, that we are, are finding. Um, apart from going back to this vampire fly we just learned that, that the cycle of this fly um, uh, has changed a bit. Um, the, 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 the larvae has shorter stages uh, in, during the, um, the warmer seasons, an extended warmer season. This is now related to climate change. So the collections of, this, of all these uh, uh, specimens um, to have a history at the time and then compared in, in the future is something that uh, uh, opens new research opportunities. Yeah. Matt, any new discoveries you want to reflect upon? Sure, a, a new discovery that was all over uh, social media and everywhere else was the discovery of a tortoise on an island that had previously had only one tortoise collected and that one and only tortoise was collected by Rollo Beck in 1906 and uh, is still housed, uh, that specimen is yeah. still housed here um, at the academy. And so it is um, a vindication of the statement that I make that mm -hmm. the academy expedition did not cause anything to go extinct. Mm -hmm. um, prior to that discovery, I would have said um, nothing was made extinct with one exception that proves mm -hmm. the rule, that would be that one tortoise. Right. But now that a tortoise has been found on that island and evidence of other tortoises on that island, um, it could be a very positive outcome for repopulating uh, the, the, the animals 
on, on that island. So, so that, that's, that's really quite interesting. And the other is that you sometimes hear about how many specimens were collected on this trip or that trip. I think it's important to realize that in the Galapagos, some 200,000 tortoises were taken by whalers and sealers and, and people like that over the years. And then even when Darwin was there in the, on the Beagle voyage, they took some 33 giant tortoises, ate them and threw the shells overboard on the way to Tahiti. So that when you hear the 200,000 and you hear the 33 and you hear that, well, the Academy took 266 in 1905 and 1906 and they're still housed in this building, you realize that the collection is still available for scientific study. So the 266, I hope, doesn't sound so bad in light of that other, uh, that other work. So the specimens, whether they're finches or, or plants or tortoises, all you need to do is get a little fingernail clipping sized piece of flesh off the, off the specimen to amplify DNA and be able to do modern studies, conduct modern studies. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why uh, museum collections are an archive. Uh, they're an archive of life in the past and they can continue to be useful when new techniques are discovered, techniques that we don't even know about today. Yeah. They can inform conservation decisions mm -hmm. and as well be used to inspire uh, with, with partners solutions. Thank you very much. I would like to invite you to ask each other questions if you have any, or invite the audience to ask questions. Do either of you have questions of each other, or do we have any audience questions? Yeah. We ask people to use the mic so everyone can hear. Uh, on the theme of conservation, <clears throat> we're all aware of climate change, and are you, I'm not sure, I, I think Dr. Um, is Juliette, you would answer this. Are you looking at what are the projections for sea level rise, the range of possibilities, and temperature changes and climate changes? And in terms of conservation, what, what would be the criteria for thinking about where you should put your efforts in the Galapagos? Uh, because, you know, if, if these things have a range of possible trajectories, what, what would be the outcomes in terms of certain species, in terms of environments there? Could you tell us a little bit about your thinking about that conservation aspect? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, a um, extremely important question, uh, a hard one to, to answer with the specifics. Uh, however, um, we, we do have um, um, records of temperatures that we are now connecting it with the studies that we're doing in various species and various ecosystems as well. Um, land birds are the most studied uh, species and however there is records of almost 20 years of, of uh, uh, monitoring of uh, coastal fish uh, in, in the Galapagos and um, it shows definitely a change in, um, in certain behavior of species, migration of, um, uh, of, of some of the species in, in the altitudinal gradient of, of the islands. Um, mosquitoes, for example. We, we didn't have mosquitoes up in the highlands of, 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 of Santa Cruz, where I live. Now mosquitoes are higher up. Um, we have found that um, in longer periods of time, the vampire fly reproduces 10 times more than in a normal um, um, warm season, and thus affecting more of the, of the, of the birds that are, um, that are living there. Um, the penguins, um, they nest um, pretty much in the high or tide mark, maybe 10 meters uh, there in the rocky shorelines. Uh, we have experience and we do know that, that the, the high tide marks uh, once or twice a year, they go beyond that. And there's some studies that um, we have been doing with collaborators in testing, I have little penguins that are there, yeah. um, testing boxes uh, in crevices to see how the penguins could really react and, and accommodate their uh, breeding time you know, to have an opportunity to save them. And all this information is shared with the Galapagos National Park, who are the decision makers, the ones that allow 
to, for scientists to go and test and, and then take those recommendations for conservation purposes. So those are some of the, the examples that I can... And you can see the challenges that there are impacts on both the endemic species, yeah. often negative, and there are also impacts on invasive species, almost positive, because the mosquitoes and the Falornis flies are all invasives. Mm -hmm. so. Any other questions? Yes, back there in the back, by Charles Darwin. management of their resources on the Galapagos and what the potential for that is moving into the future? Did you hear that? Or? Can, can you repeat can you? the question? Sure. Yeah. Can you uh, comment on uh, the engagement of local communities in the conservation and management of, of Galapagos ecosystems? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, indeed, there is a lot of work to do. Um, however, I think um, those of you that have uh, visited the Galapagos, uh, either it was San Cristobal or Santa Cruz or Isabella, um, in general, there is this uh, sense of, of care uh, for nature. Um, but not everybody um, shows that uh, attitude. There's always, as I say, there's always someone that goes across the red light. Um, but in, within the the, the system itself, when we have uh, newcomers uh, to the islands to work and provide services either um, in the institutions, uh, the bureaucracy, or also in the services for tourism, uh, because the, at the local level education is limited. And there's 300 uh, high school kids that graduate every year and there is a very small percentage, about 5% are, have the opportunity to go back uh, or to go to the mainland to go and pursue university studies and then go back, train to, to fulfill the, the services. So there is people that are needed that are coming with no, no sense of what Galapagos, living in Galapagos is. And they have this continental way of thinking. And that influences some of the locals as, as well. So the efforts of engaging the community, uh, translating the importance of, of the results of science uh, to get them to, to know more the environment in which they live in is tremendously important. Uh, and this was something that uh, we, we look forward to, to, to uh, implement stronger uh, with the California Academy of Sciences using the iNaturalist, uh, the engagement with um, bringing in the, the, the locals to see what we do and how we can uh, also leverage on mechanism of, of, of transmitting that to, to the locals is, um, is definitely important. The future of the islands mostly depend on the locals uh, because they will be the gardens. We are the gardens. Uh, if we don't really uh, get to know what is there, um, it will be hard. Thank you. One last question. I'm wondering how the fisheries are managed in the Galapagos, because it's my understanding that local fishermen are allowed to fish in those waters. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, there has been um, successes in the protection of the uh, Galapagos Marine Reserve. Um, in 1998, the protection of the marine reserve uh, from uh, 15 nautical miles was extended to 40 nautical miles around the archipelago, uh, uh, reaching 138,000 square kilometers. Uh, the industrial fishing was banned uh, from the Galapagos Marine Reserve, and local fishermen are the only ones that are allowed. Yes, um, there has been a, uh, a process in which uh, we had uh, had to work with the local fishermen. There's four cooperative of fishermen there. Um, little attention has been put to the cooperatives. We have delivered um, scientific information on the life cycles of most of the commercial uh, fish. However, um, opportunities for them to uh, commercialize, uh, to cut the, the chain of, of, of um, intermediates to, to sell the products 
uh, makes it a, a more difficult. Um, nevertheless, um, there's about 500 uh, fishermen, local fishermen, that are active. Uh, it's not a big number. Yes, some of them have uh, been given the opportunity to be part of the uh, tourism industry. Um, some, of, uh, some of you have experienced the, uh, um, the uh, fishing uh, tours in the Galapagos. Um, less and less they are fishing, actually. They are becoming just a, a day tour. So there's plenty of, of, of things that uh, we need to be doing with the fishermen. Um, it does represent a certain threat, but uh, not as big as the industrial fishing fleets uh, which are surrounding the Galapagos Islands and uh, that are in international waters even, and that are not just affecting uh, the marine life nearby the Galapagos, but in many other regions uh, nearby, like Marpello, uh, Cocos on Costa Rica, and, uh, and, and Panama as well. We have to close. Oh, oh, did you have a well, one last yeah. question? Oh, okay. <laughs> Absolute last question. <laughs> what we could do to help with the conservation effort. So for example, would you recommend that we go or that we not go? Would you recommend that we go to schools and help to explain to children what's happening in Galapagos? What would you recommend that we do? Those of us who are interested in helping. But the question is, what what do our speakers recommend that we do? Uh, as individuals to help protect the Galapagos? Uh, thank you uh, for, that, for that question. Uh, we need as much help as possible. Um, we need funds, yes. Uh, that's definitely uh, a key element. Uh, but we, we also need new thinking. We, we, we need ideas uh, from everybody that could uh, be uh, shared and we can take them on board as well. Um, we need volunteers um, in, in all sort of, of fields, um, English, uh, technology, uh, science, of course. Um, there is a, a complex of, 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 um, of situations that are happening there. Um, but I am positive that um, the, the people that, that seize the Galapagos Islands, and, and I am pretty sure that, that you uh, have uh, realized how important this fragile and unique place. No wonder is the 001 registered World Heritage Site. That belongs to everybody, not just to Ecuador, but to everybody. Um, and it requires a lot of help, particularly uh, with this uh, globalization, over-exploitation, uh, and consumption of, of resources. Um, so uh, funding, new ideas, uh, collaboration, uh, it's, it's more than important. We'll have a lot more opportunities to ask our speakers some questions over dinner and over our party after dark later. So I, at this time, I invite you all to please join us for dinner in the tent. We're barely going to, no, we'll be fine. So please join us for dinner and thank, thank you. Again.